Thank you everyone for joining us on our next episode of Seafood Ninja Sus. Today, we're going to be doing our first interview with Andrew Mallison. He's the founder and CEO of Fish Tank. He has over 40 years of experience in the seafood industry. Before launching Fish Tank, he was also the CEO of the Global Aquaculture Alliance. Prior to that position, he was the Director General of IFFO the International Trade Association, representing producers, traders, and buyers in the marine ingredients sector. He was also the Global Procurement Manager for Seafood at UK-based retailer Marks & Spencer and Director of Standards and Licensing at the Marine Stewardship Council. Andrew has also been an expert advisor for government and ministerial level into the UN, Food and Agriculture Organization, and trained as a performance management coach. He has been recognized in 2012 by Interfish as one of the top 100 international seafood executives. In 2008, he was listed as the food hero by the UK Observer Magazine. And in 2006, he led the team on Marks & Spencer to be selected as an inaugural seafood champions by SeaWeb. Most recently, he has published What's the Catch, a guide on how to buy better quality seafood and the backstory to good fishing and fish farming, which is available on Amazon in Kindle and paperback. We are truly honored to have Andrew as our first interview, and we hope you enjoy this chat about cod and seafood industry. Thank you so much for for joining our, our podcast, for supporting this project. And uh, with Evaluna learning more about seafood and being uh, the next seafoodie. So this is her first interview. And uh, thank you for participating. So I think uh, first I'll let her introduce herself. Mm -hmm. Hi, Andrew. My name is Evaluna. I'm in second grade. And I tried car yesterday, I believe. And I like the car. <laughs> I have a few questions. Okay. Well, it's nice to meet you, Evaluna. And uh, I'm really pleased that you're interested in seafood. Uh, it's something I've been interested in all my life. So uh, I'm happy to talk to you and I look forward to hearing your questions. Great. So, Andrew, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, um, I know that you're the founder of Fish Tank and you're also a book author. Could you tell us a little bit of how many years you have been in the seafood industry and how you got started? Okay, well, it, it's a, a long time. Uh, so when I was uh, about 14 or 15, I used to watch a program on TV and it was a lot, when, you, when I say we'd only just had a TV. It was fairly new to see our first television. So that tells you how long ago it was. Uh, and I used to watch on the, our first television in my family's house, uh, a man called Jacques Cousteau. And he was a French man who used to love the ocean and he would sail uh, in his boat and dive under the water to see the thousands of fish uh, in the ocean. And he was a famous marine biologist. So uh, I thought when I watched his program and these beautiful fish and the oceans, that that's what I wanted to do for, the, for, for my life, for my work. So uh, at, at school, I studied oceans. And when I wanted to learn more and go to university, I found a, a, a course which was about oceans and fishing. So I studied that and then started working actually in the seafood industry. Uh, so that was now about uh, 40 years, 40 years ago. So it's been quite a long time, but it's been a wonderful industry and I've enjoyed every day. Wow, that's great. Thanks for, for sharing it with us a little bit about yourself. I know that you have some questions about COD. About like, yes. About nine or ten, yes, long, a lot of questions. And I know um, she mentioned that she tried cod yesterday, so this is why we want to talk about cod. And I know you have lots of experience um, with all sorts of seafood products. So I think if Eva, you want to start with your first question. Sure. How is it like being a seafood executive? <laughs> How is it like to be a seafood executive? I can't. Oh, what's it like to be a seafood executive? Well. Um, that's a job. It, it sounds 
sort of fancy, you know, being an executive. And I, I, I started off in the seafood industry. To me, it was all about shoes. You know, when you start off, you're wearing boots. You know, you're working in a fish factory, maybe, and you're wearing rubber boots because it's wet and there's bits of fish around and you have to have waterproof boots so you don't get your feet wet. And then eventually you learn enough about fish to be able to start doing things, maybe sitting in an office and working on the telephone or, or now on a computer. And you don't wear boots anymore, you wear nice shoes. So I guess an executive, a seafood executive of somebody who can now wear nice shoes instead of rubber boots. So for me, that's what being a seafood executive would be. You're working with other people. Uh, you are maybe working all around the world. And I have traveled, I think, to 50 countries now uh, to, to do with seafood, uh, to where it has come from, where it is farmed or where it is caught. And part of what I write about now is my adventures in some of these countries. So if you want to learn, you know, what I found in somewhere like Alaska, which I'm sure you've heard about, or maybe somewhere further away like Madagascar, which is in the Indian Ocean, or China, um, then I write about my experiences in these places. And the seafood industry is fantastic because it allows you to see these places, to travel there, and somebody else pays for it. It's part of your job. <laughs> So you can go and have these adventures as part of your uh, what you do to for a living. And here's my here, I don't know. Can you here's look? Here's Freya. Here's Freya. Hey Freya, hello Freya. Yeah. So she's coming yeah. to check on me. Yeah, we saw the door creeping, moving. You know, I was waiting for for uh, Freya yeah, to jump. Sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll that uh, okay. So that's what it's like. Does, does, is there, does that make sense, uh, Eva Luna? Do you, does that you know, make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, I think that that's really awesome. So, you know, you probably can share with us some adventures maybe that you have had with, with as it relates to COD, since it's what we are talking about this week. Um, Eva, do you want to say like the first question about, about COD that you wrote? Sure. Is cod really popular? Is cod very popular? Yes. Yes. It's probably in the top five of what most people in certainly North America. <laughs> Freya's found a squeaky toy. <laughs> uh, in North America or uh, Europe or I mean other parts of the world like China, they may eat different sort of fish and they eat a lot of carp for example, which is another type of white fish. Uh, but cod is very, very popular in uh, America, Canada, the north, what you call the North Atlantic areas, because that's where it comes from mostly. Some from the North Pacific, uh, but that's a slightly different sort of cod. But yes, it's, it's one of the most popular type of fish and has been for a very long time. Okay. So my eighth because question... I have nine questions written here. Okay. I'm going to say them by order, but not by order, it's numbers. <laughs> okay. So my eighth question is, in 1992, did the Atlantic Northwest cod fishery collapse? Yes, it did. And uh, it was a shock to a lot of people because that, that fishery, and a fishery is what you call uh, a part of the ocean where you find a certain type of fish and there are boats that go and catch it. So a fishery is people going to catch a certain type of fish in a certain place. So the North Atlantic uh, cod stock, uh, which was off the coast of Canada, partly like Newfoundland off the coast of Canada and also off the coast of Maine. And it was a part of the ocean called the Grand Banks. And they were called that because the ocean was a little bit more shallow in that area. And there were so many fish that used to live there in around the 1600s and 1700s. So maybe, you know, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, 
There were stories that there were so many fish, you could go out in a little rowing boat with a basket and you could put your basket in the water and scoop it up and just it would be full of fish. That's what the story said. The basket would be full of fish just by scooping it in the water. Now, I'm not sure if that was really true, but they said there's a lot, a lot of fish in, the, in that area. And there had been for many years and people all the way from Spain and Portugal and also from uh, the UK used to sail from Europe across to the coast of Canada, across the Atlantic to go fishing. And they would catch this fish and they would dry it and salt it so it would stay, uh, it wouldn't go bad. And then they would take it to the Caribbean where they would trade it for things like uh, spices or uh, rum. They used to like buying rum and then they would take that back to Europe. So there was a three-way trade from Europe to North America, down to the Caribbean and then back to Europe again. These would go around. And there's a very, very good book, which I've got off my bookshelf. It's, it's called Cod, the History, uh, sorry, a biography of the fish that changed the world. So that's how important Cod was because it created this movement of people that went from one country to another. It's by a man called Mark Kurlansky. And uh, he very kindly, let me see, let's see, open this up here. He, he signed it for me, wow. for, for me to, to look at. And uh, if you are interested in cod, this tells you all about the history of it, how long people have been eating cod. Uh, so it's a, it's, it, it's a historical fish and it did change and has changed the world. Yes, and you know, the, um, this is before there were refrigerators, right? So they had to salt the cod. Do you know what that means? Yeah, like put salt on it? Yeah, they would put salt on it and let it like dry so that way it wouldn't spoil and wouldn't go bad because there was no refrigeration. That's and right. That's how no the vegetable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all of these fish that used to be caught for many, many years, eventually people got better and better at catching fish because when they first started, they just had like rowing boats or sailing boats. And then they had boats with engines and then the boats with engines could catch more fish. And so eventually they were catching the fish faster than the fish could grow, could have babies and, and reproduce, make more fish. So in 1992, there were then so few fish left that the government in Canada decided to have what they called a moratorium, which means no more fishing. Everything has to stop. And it created a lot of problems because there were many small fishing communities that depended on the fishing and suddenly they had no fish to eat and no way of making money to earn a living. So it was a big shock to everybody and caused a lot of heartache and problems for people in communities. And uh, it, learnt, it taught a lot of lessons, how you have to no longer take it for granted that there will always be fish. We fishermen are now uh, capable of catching so many fish that they will disappear. Maybe not catch the very last fish ever, but they would certainly catch, so they could catch so many that there aren't any more left for anybody else to catch. And you have to stop fishing. So... It did collapse and uh, it was a big lesson for the fishing industry. What could happen even to a fishery like this Grand Banks where there had been millions and millions of fish for hundreds of years. It, it taught everybody that you cannot assume now that that fish will still be there next year if you go and catch it all. See, and this is why like mom and a lot of people work about you know, trying to promote sustainable seafood and trying to teach consumers and people like you and me and, and our friends how to use their purchasing power to help drive change in the water. Because if we are conscious about the, the challenges and the damage that overfishing can cause on the fishery, like what happened with the cotton in 1992, then we can make better choices when we go in the grocery store and buy fish which is a great, great segue for the question that you have, number three. 
about the, the label that you have seen on some of the, the fish? You would like to ask that question? Yes. So do you know lots about cod and some cooked cod? There in the stores has a label that says MSC. What does what does it stand for? Okay, well, that's a very good question. And it, it fits very nicely with the one you asked before about, well, how do you stop this ever happening again? Uh, so MSC stands for the Marine Stewardship Council. And this is a group of people that started working not long after the Grand Banks COD collapse. It was started about 1994, 96, I think, something like that. And they wondered to themselves, what would a fishery look like that was well managed? And so they got maybe 200 different scientists and people, experts in this to say, well, if you obviously don't catch too many fish, and if you have rules and regulations to make sure that that is protected, that's the way you work, and if in the catching of that fish, you don't damage something else, but just move the problem from one thing to another, then that's what we will call sustainable. And we will give that fishery uh, a certificate to say that we uh, have got experts to look at what happens. We have checked all the records and how much fish you have been catching. We have looked at how you catch that fish to make sure you're not catching something else like dolphins or seabirds or making sure something else isn't injured at the same time. And we know that there's, uh, there are rules to make sure you continue to do this. And if you can prove these things, we'll give you a certificate and that's, then you can put the, our, our logo on your packet of fish that you sell to tell everybody that you have this certificate. And that's what the Marine Stewardship Council was set up to do and still does. Uh, and they certify fisheries. If you are going to catch some fish, you have a boat and you want to prove to everybody else that you sell your fish to, you can say to the Marine Stewardship Council, please come and check uh, how I catch my fish. And if, uh, they are, if they believe it meets their rules, uh, 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 and requirements and how they have defined sustainability, they will give you a certificate and you can tell your customers, I catch my fish in the right way and I can, I have my certificate and every pack of fish I sell, I can put MSC logo, the little blue logo on the packet and it tells them that your fish is sustainable. You see, so this is another great tool, right? That our consumers can utilize when they go to a store and they're not sure what kind of fish it's sustainable or responsible, they can always look for a label like MSC or, you know, for aquaculture, ASC or BEP or Global Gap um, to help them sort of sort through all these messaging and it makes it easier for the consumers to know what kind of products will meet their, their sustainability commitments, right? That's right. That's right. Because we don't have time to in your when you're going to buy some fish to go and do all of this homework. And uh, it's easy if you can look at a packet of fish, you see the logo and then you can be sure that it is sustainable rather than you having to do all those checks for yourself. Very nice. Do you have any questions more about MSE? What you just mentioned? No more MSE questions, but more COD questions. Like what? What kind of questions? Has COD been around since the Stone Age? Yes, it has. Uh, it's been around for a very long time. Um, I don't, you know, you can look back in fossil records and as you probably know, there's, there's a process of evolution. So there were prehistoric fish, but certainly since the Stone Age, COD has been around for as long as humans have. Um, and just to let you know, it can be a little bit confusing because when most people talk about cod, they talk about the Atlantic cod, the North Atlantic cod. But it also has a close cousin in the Pacific. And that's a different species. It's not the same. And that's called Pacific cod. And then there are lots of other fish that are called cod, but aren't members of the same family at all. Uh, 
In fact, there's also one caught off the coast of Alaska that's called black cod, but it's not a member of the cod family. It's uh, also known as uh, sable fish because it's black, has a velvety skin, very deep water fish, uh, but it's not a member of the cod family. And sometimes you might hear of rock cod, you know, for reef fish, and that's not a cod either. Uh, so because cod has been around for so long, if somebody sees a fish and it has sort of a white, white um, flesh to eat, the fillet is white, people think, oh, we'll call it cod. We'll call it rock cod, or we'll call it spotted cod, or reef cod, or something else. But the, the, the cod that you talk about, because it's been around for so long, the original one, if you like, was this one that used to be caught off, you know, in the Grand Banks, had the stock collapse. That's the, uh, the original one, if you like, uh, the North Atlantic cod. And they all have Latin names, almost sounds a bit like Spanish. So it's called Garus Morua. So that's, that's the, the scientific name. And when you get interested in fish, you have to start thinking about the scientific name because the fish seafood industry is full of fish which are called the same name, but they're different yes. types of fish. Very, can be very confusing. Yes, it can be very, very confusing. Um, how about we talk about the benefits of eating cod since it's so important to include seafood in our diet so we can be healthy, especially for children. I know that you had a question. Um, I think it's number four. Would you like to ask that question? Does cod have omega-3 fatty acids? Well, it has some, but they're kind of low. And the reason for that is that cod generally has a very low fat level, which is, is a good thing. It's very high in protein, very low in carbohydrates, and very low in fat. So it's a very healthy fish to eat, but it doesn't have a lot of omega-3 because cod lives near the seabed. And what it eats, and it eats almost anything, cod has a reputation for being, you know, it, it, it just, whatever comes past, cod will eat. <laughs> but omega-3 come from algae, which tends to be in the top, near the surface of the ocean. And so you find fish like mackerel and tuna and herring uh, who eat near the surface of the ocean, sardines. They have lots of omega-3 in them. And then the fish that eat those things like tuna, they also have lots of omega-3 because they get it from the fish that they've been eating. But that's at the top, the surface, 10 meters, 20 meters of the ocean. So cod living near the bottom, near the seabed, doesn't eat much of those algae and doesn't eat those other fish, which have the omega-3 that they from the fish they've eaten. So it's about diet, you know, it depends what it eats. It's a very healthy fish, but it doesn't have much omega-3. Great. So um, I think that we should talk about your experience eating cod yesterday. How did you like it? The cod was a little flaky, but good. It was flaky, but it was good. Do you remember the story you told me about when is the best to eat cod? Do you I, like to I, share that? Sure, sure. Because uh, I, I've also, I probably ate my first cod when I was about the same age as you, Evelina. And I thought, yeah, it's okay. It doesn't, it's not really a strong taste. It's easy to eat. It uh, doesn't have a lot of bones in it. It's easy. Um, but it wasn't one of my favorites. It, it's, uh, and I thought cod was, was okay, you know, but I, I wouldn't say it's one of my favorites. And then when I was working, in the seafood industry, one of the really interesting countries that I had to go to was Iceland. And uh, I went to a fish factory that was processing cod from the fishing boat. They would cut it into fillets and then they would freeze it and it would be sent all around the world to different shops. And so they said, would you like to go on a fishing boat to catch some cod? And I said, oh, sure, yeah, I would like that a lot. So uh, we went out on a fishing boat and uh, I, I caught some fish myself, uh, as well as the big net that they catch the cod in. They had some fishing rods. So we, we, I caught some fish with a hook and a line. 
And when we got back about an hour or two later, we, they went to a restaurant and we said, we can cook this cod for you. So I cooked it and ate it. And I was really surprised because it was soft and watery and didn't taste of much. And I thought it would be a lot better because in Iceland before I had eaten some really good cod it, where they had roasted it. Uh, they put it in a pan and they cooked it quickly just to get a little bit of color and then roasted it in an oven and I had it with some mashed potatoes and it was really, really good. And I asked, well, why is it? Why is this tasting like nothing? And they said, well, it's because uh, cod and the same would be for haddock and a couple of other similar white fish. It's a bit like steak, like a beef steak. It needs a little bit of time to mature. So you have to wait for the flavor to develop really before you eat it. And the captain of the fishing boat was telling me, yeah, when we're out for a few days, if we want to eat some fish, we don't take the fish that we've just caught. We take the fish that we maybe caught three or four days ago and it's in the, in the hold of the, of the ship with the ice, getting nice and cold because it will taste better. So I realized that for some fish, not all, but some fish, you have to let them get a little bit older for the flavor to develop. And then it tastes a lot nicer uh, than if you'd eaten it straight away. Other fish like salmon or mackerel or tuna uh, or flatfish, you have to eat them sooner the better because the, the, the flavor just gradually then deteriorates over time. But for whitefish like cod, they're best if you leave them for a few days. So I learned something on that trip. Wow, that's really interesting, you know, because we always talk about how eating a fresh fish is the best. But in this mm -hmm. case, it's better if it sits in cold ice, you know, not in the heat, but in cold ice for a few days. So it, it catches that firmness and that flavor. So Right, right. And there are scientists who study this sort of thing and will eat it every day from the day it's caught. And they will make a little curve like this. It goes up, or as you look at it, it goes up, then it goes down. So the flavor improves, and then it starts to decline. And it also gets a lot more complicated if the fish is has struggled a lot, mm -hmm. uh, or the fish has been in the net that has been towed for a long time. That affects the flavor. It's not so good. So there's a lot now understood about the eating quality and flavor of the fish and if you really want the best, you look for you maybe fish caught by a hook and line, um, and then it's kept on ice. Because if the fish is being caught by a net, a trawler, which has been towed for a, for a long time, maybe six or eight hours, and the fish gets exhausted, it burns up a lot of its glycogen, a lot of, of, the, of its energy, and then it falls into the back of the net. That fish won't taste as good as fish which has not had a big struggle. Uh, before it was caught. Yeah, that that's, says a lot about like the, the proper ways of fish handling and yeah. you know, while it's being caught and also processed. So I think we should go maybe talk about your, your last question. I think that would be a great question to kind of wrap up this wonderful chat about cod. Would you like to ask sure. a question? What's your favorite way to prepare cod? My favorite way to prepare cod, I think, is that way that I, when I, I the best I've ever tasted. You know, wh wh when I wrote my first book, uh, which includes a, ch a chapter on cod, the end of each chapter, I put what's the best, you know, the best I've ever had. Uh, and for cod, the best I've ever had was in that restaurant in Iceland where they took fish that had been caught by a small boat who was only out for a day at a time. They caught it with a hook and a line, not so much with a trawl. And um, I'm not saying trawl is bad, but this was the best I'd eaten. Hook and line fish, caught very, very fresh. It'd been left on ice for a couple of days. And then they had uh, roasted it in an oven. And I think it was with some mashed potatoes and with some uh, roasted tomatoes as well, because tomato and cod go really well together. Uh, and if you look at uh, Portuguese and Mediterranean cooking, for example, which is famous for, for cod, they, they often use tomato and uh, cod together. So my best ever was in Iceland and it was roasted cod with roasted tomatoes and mashed potato. That sounds wonderful. And you love tomatoes. So I think we should try 
to do that at home. Maybe maybe she'll enjoy it much more, much better than I, yesterday. I, I just realized my, my English accent is saying tomatoes. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and it's not pretty much, you know, like in Spanish would be tomates. So yeah. tomato, tomato, tomate. Tomato, yeah. tomato. And that's, that's her favorite. I think she, you know, Eva can eat tomatoes yeah. for breakfast. So yeah. <laughs> that's, a, and, that's a good tip. And they also love the mashed potatoes, so. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah. How, how did you how did you have your card yesterday, Evelina? How, what did you well, eat with it? I well, I actually ate chicken, but it had a card to try. Oh, you so, tried the card. Okay. I tried the card. It was good. It was a right. uh, beer batter. It was beer batter, like um, fish oh. and chips style. Yes. Sure, sure. I, I really, that's how, you know, we have fish and chips with cod. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do love it like that as well. But I was trying to be a little bit more healthy because uh, the, the, <laughs> the fried <laughs> fish is not quite so healthy for you as a roasted piece of, of cod. But it's very, very nice. Definitely not. We also had a pan seared one with, um, oh my goodness, with capers mm -hmm. and some garlic and butter. But um, she was less brave on, on that one right. than the fried one. So, Well, you got to start slowly. Start a little bit, and then if you like it, next time you have a little bit more. But, uh, Evelina, your mom sounds like she's a very good cook. Yeah, we try. So, anyways, well, do you have any other questions, Eva? That you would like to? Well, I think we covered pretty much all your yeah. questions. Anything else that you would really, really like to know before? What? Wait, no, you haven't. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think we have covered all of our nine questions. Okay. And any word of advice to parents that want to introduce cod in their kids' diet, other than trying, you know, roasted or, or you know, fish and chips or any anything you would like to add that we can use as a tip? Uh, sure. I, I think. Um... What, how we started this conversation about sustainability, you know, it's very important to not only find good fish that, that you're going to enjoy eating, but you're making uh, good choices about where you buy it from, who you buy it from. Um, because like with anything, there are people out there who will try and do things not so well, and maybe because they think it'll make it cheaper. And... Um, you, you should always be careful and reward the people who are trying to do it properly. Because the thing with, with fishing is that if you catch a lot of fish at the same time, it's going to make it a bit cheaper when you, when you want to sell your fish. But if you say, no, I'm going to leave some for tomorrow or next year. So all the little ones are going to let them grow bigger. It's maybe going to make your fishing a little bit more expensive. You don't make so much money because you're not taking them all straight away. So you have to reward the people who are trying to do it properly and leave some fish for the future. Uh, and talking about the future, I, I think it's wonderful that uh, a, a girl like you is interested in this industry. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for girls and young women uh, to get into this industry. When you look at um, you know, the industry today, if you go, well, we can't at the moment because of COVID-19, but there are often conferences where lots of people get together and they talk about what's happening in the fishing industry. And when I look around, there's a lot of older people and a lot of men who uh, have, have worked hard, like I think I have done, to in the industry. But we need more women in the industry because it gives better Decision making, if you have this different perspective, men and women work really well together. And if it's just men, I think you're not going to get such a good decision on how you run a business is if you have some women who are also saying, well, have you thought about this or what about that point of view? Uh, so we need more young women in the fishing industry and hopefully you'll be one of them, Evelina. Yeah. Go, we'll definitely bring her along to the conference when she's old enough um, so she can also experience that part of the work that we do. Yeah. Um, I remember when my dad brought me to my first Boston Seafood Show and I wasn't in the industry. I was still in um, doing graduate school in college. So it was definitely an experience. And, and I think, you know, now that we 
Eva, it's learning so much from so you know from, from very little. I think it would be really great, you know, to bring her into these conversations. Yeah, yeah. Well, it all it all starts with that interest and uh, having something that re you really love, uh, because if you love it, you're going to be successful at it. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And, and we learned, I learned a lot too, which is great. I think part of this experience is also how much I'm learning as well from different products along with, alongside with her. And, and then um, we're all developing, I guess, our interviewer skills together. So this is really being wonderful. And also be, you know, for the patients with a technology, you know, little bumps on the road, but we're getting that iron data as we move along. So I sure appreciate you, you know, joining us this afternoon. And we look forward to continuing this conversation. And I will definitely be in touch with the final product. Okay, well, I, I've enjoyed it. It's been wonderful to talk to you, Eveluna. And I, they were very good questions. I really had to think hard about those <laughs> questions and what answers to give you. So thank you for asking the questions. And uh, I wish you good luck with the podcasts and the interviews you're doing. You're welcome. Bye. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, guys, it's a wrap. This was our first interview. I am so proud of Miss Luna and her questions that she developed after doing some research herself. I hope that you enjoy the podcast and that you're willing to try out some cod. When you do try it, please let us know how you like it and also make sure it comes from a responsible fishery or a fishery that has been certified as sustainable. Thank you all and we'll join you next week with a new episode.